Psalms chapter 138, I just kind of want to share a little, quick little introduction. And because here in these, there's only eight verses, but we're going to pull some golden nuggets out of there. Of course, the whole word is like gold, and that will help us in our relationship with the Lord. And so here, we, we will realize and be reminded that every believer should live with a strong confidence in the sovereignty of of the Lord over his or her life. We, we have to re know and we have to remember that he's in control of everything. And sometimes we, we lose. I'm like you. I, I lose sight of that when something, I get some bad news on the phone or my kids are acting up or there's a problem or I have to go to the doctor and the, there's concerns and trials that we go through, maybe financial and, and, and sicknesses and things like that that... In those moments, the, the devil tries to get us to forget that, that God is still in control. You know, it's easy for me to say, yeah, God's in control when the money's there and the bills are being paid and everybody's healthy and you're not having any serious problems going on. But, but man, when it seems like everything's falling apart, when it seems like everything's against you, and, and nobody's immune to that. That's why um, I want to say it in the right way. Um, I'm against uh, these kind of teachings that tell you that if you say all the right things and you give your tithes and offerings, you say your prayers right, that you're never going to get sick and your kids are going to grow up and all be like Billy Graham, amen, you know. And, and if you have problems, if you have a trial, it's because you didn't pray enough this morning. If you get in a car accident on the way to work, maybe it's because you didn't pray last week and all these weird trips. I sat under those teachings when I was in the home. And uh, there's, there's some good that you get out of it, but the basic uh, kind of a concept of that is, is not right. Because you get this idea that if you're walking right, then you shouldn't suffer. But then what do you do with all these verses that talk about suffering and trials and tribulations for in a time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. Peter used that word suffer more than once. He said, man, through the things you suffer, you're settled, you're established, and you're strengthened. So even that scripture right there in 1 Peter chapter 10 lets us know that through the things we suffer, he can do something in our life. It's kind of like God gets the good and the bad and he kind of intertwines them in our heart and, and makes us uh, the people that we're supposed to be. Well, David, King David, wasn't perfect and we all know that. That's why a lot of people like Psalms. I know people that aren't, aren't even Christian, they say, man, when I go through a rough time, I get my mom's Bible and start reading Psalms. Because there's a lot of comfort. And not only that, but we can relate. So every believer, we're going to kind of see this today, can live with, should live with a strong confidence in the sovereignty of the Lord over his or her life, that God controls us. And then at the same time, we realize that we have a responsibility too. You know, that we have to make choices and we have to respond the right way. I mean, you showed up to church today. God didn't make you come. It's not like he beat you in the back of the head or something or handcuffed you and put you in the car. He, he's the one that told you to come. And, and all you did is respond to that, you see. You know, and, and like Chuck Smith used to say, that our whole walk with the Lord is, if, if we're living right with him, is just responding to his calling and, and his tugs and his love. So for, for us to get saved, even, we can't even take credit for that. For by grace are we saved, not by works. Let's any man should boast, right? So even when you pray, and I pray, it's because God told you to pray. And sometimes you'll drop names in your heart. You say, God, that's weird. I haven't thought about that guy in a long time. Well, maybe God wants you to pray for him or her. We respond to that uh, kind of uh, tugs on our heart. And so God is in control of everything. But at the same time, we make choices and hopefully we make the right steps to even protect our own lives. We don't do dumb stuff. I mean, we know certain things aren't healthy for us. And, of course, you, know, you think about a lot of things that uh, we should do and shouldn't do. And so David went through a lot of serious trials in his life, but he trusted that God's will would definitely be fulfilled in his life. That's one thing about David, who was far from perfect, committed murder, adultery, blood was in his hands, but he's the only one where God said, he's a man after my heart, because he just loved the Lord, he praised the Lord. When he, when he did mess up, he really felt bad about it. And, and you guys know this, and I, I know you guys learned this, and you've read it, that when we sin, when we mess up, there's something wrong if I don't feel that bad about it. 
Because that means I'm going to do it again. Sometimes in our first couple of years with the Lord, we're, we're very conscious of things. We're very soft-hearted. And even if we think wrong, we feel bad. If I say something a little harsh to somebody at work, and I say, man, dude, I'm, I'm sorry. I, and then something bad has happened in the next couple of years. I, uh, those kind of things don't bother me no more. While my conscience is being affected, it's being seared. That's why Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they're the ones that will see God. They're the ones that will see God and what he's doing in their life. And so uh, we have to just keep that our hearts soft before the Lord. And David knew that, even though all this stuff he went through, he knew that God's will would be fulfilled in his life. One of the main things we will see in these few verses in this chapter is that David, even with his imperfections in his life, we will see in this chapter that David had a lifetime of trust in the Lord. And in our walk with the Lord, it, we should be in it for the long haul. It breaks my heart. And, and I, I said, shared this in, our, in the first service this morning that when I see guys, I had, there was a guy who got out of the county jail about a year ago. And, he, and then the same day he came to our church. He wanted me to pray with him and stuff. And he said, I still got to go back to court. I might go to prison. And, and I prayed with him, but, but I shared with him, brother, you're going to have to serve the Lord. You, you, I, I'll pray with you, but God's like, God's not like some Santa Claus. He's going to give you the gift to get up. No, I go to prison, then, you know, say bye, and it's all over. I always say in church, sometimes we treat God like a bales bondsman. You know, he gets you out of a mess. It's, Thank God. Thank you, Lord. Go help somebody else. And then we go on our merry way, and we go back into our mud. You know, when, when a guy or a girl, can you say Amen. When a girl gets out of the county jail, you know, or a guy, I mean, if, you got, if a person gets bailed out, you don't go hug the bail's bonds. I mean, you don't even know who he is. You just walk by and go do your thing or whatever. But how many know we shouldn't treat God that way? When God does a miracle for you or me or anybody, it's because he wants us to live for him and to serve him. And so David had this lifetime of trust in the Lord. He was in it for the long haul. How, how do I trust in God tomorrow and, and next week and next year? It's, it's what you do today. If you're doing okay today, it's because you did the right things yesterday and all month and all year. We, and, and the main thing we should be concerned about is the word, getting the word in our heart. Because that will do everything. And then everything flows from that. So in the midst of disappointments and heartaches, David still trusted in the Lord. If you look at verse 1 of Psalms chapter 138, David said, I will praise you with my whole heart before the gods. I will sing praises to you. And you see that all the time with David. And what we have to realize, he, he didn't do this because it sounded cute just to say, oh, I praise the Lord. No, he knew there was power in that. And, and number one, he did it because he loved the Lord, but he knew there was power in it. In fact, Romans chapter 1 says that people that have darkened hearts is because they became unthankful. So if you flip side that, and if I stop thanking God, it doesn't matter if I try to or not, I'm going to begin to backslide because I'm ungrateful. And all of a sudden, I start backpedaling. That's, that's not the only thing we should do, but I believe that's one of the main things is we have to praise God every day, you know, and worship God. It doesn't mean you're standing, you know, screaming in the market or whatever, praise the Lord, I'm going to throw you in a mental hospital, you know. But, but it's, it's a lifestyle, too. I mean, you can be in the market and pushing your card and looking at everything. And, and the Spirit of God may just tell you, you know, just praise the Lord right now. You, you, you praise God in church. You praise God on the way to, from church. You praise God in your backyard. You're watering, whatever. God doesn't care where you're at. He's going to remind you and remind me. Thank me. Praise me. Say a prayer to me. So that's the Holy Spirit. There's power in praise. In fact, the devil hates it when you stop praising God because now he knows he's kind of got you in a corner now. You're, you're getting bitter now. It, 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 if you know you're growing in the Lord when you say thank you, Lord, and you're in the middle of a very scary trial. When you don't have no feelings, but you're still praising God. We praise God no matter how we feel. The Bible says we live by faith and not by sight. Very important. So look at what David we see it all the time in, the pra in his chapters. Uh, in the chapters, I will praise you with my whole heart before the gods. I will sing praises to you. Now, gods can mean judges. It can mean leaders, human leaders. It, but it also means uh, deities, pagan, false gods. So you get this picture like David. 
He didn't care what was going on around him. He don't care if there's enemies around him. He don't care if there's devils around him. He's going to keep praising God. We, we live in a very dark society, a very anti-Christ society, where the kids get in trouble for if they get caught praying in school. Uh, people get reprimanded when they get their diploma in high school, in many high schools, if they talk about Jesus. That's just one example. Judges get telling all the judges to take the Ten Commandments down from their offices and stuff like that. We live in a very dark society. But we have to be careful and be reminded, don't let that intimidate you. It doesn't mean you act smart. Hey, I'm a Christian. Well, are you? You know, kind of. You no, know, that's not what we're trying to portray. Some Christians, I don't like to be around them. They're scary. And they, they, they look crazy, too. You know, they stare at you. Hey, brother, God, show me your heart. Dude, man. My wife don't even know my heart. Who are you? You know, it's kind of like, you know, they scare people. And they go in the restaurant and they... They're like, you know, Christian cowboys. They want to save everybody. You know, they come in with their spiritual guns and everybody against, oh, get against the wall. We're going to preach the gospel. Oh, yeah, they all get saved because they don't get shot, you know. <laughs> but, you know, and at the same time, we're not to be afraid to share the gospel. You guys know that. You learn from the word of God. The Bible says he that wins souls is wise. It's not wise to get in you don't even know a person. You meet them and say, hey, brother, do you know if you died right now, you'd go to hell? Now, I'm not saying there, there would never be a time. God may lead you to do that, but it depends on the situation, and it depends on the person. But generally speaking, you get to know people first. Be their friend. I mean, I, I've been able to lead people to the Lord, not by scaring them, but being their friend. You, people, love will cover a multitude of sins, you see. And, and so me being a pastor, I, you know, I'm, I'm like David. I just dress normal. I don't go to Albertsons with a suit, you know, walking around with a white collar. Or, I, you know, I've met people. I, they, they show that thing where I'm wearing a Dodger hat. I'm always wearing a Dodger hat, you know. And I walk to the market, and I'll meet somebody, and maybe I haven't seen in years. And, and they'll say, or one of my friends came by the church the other day and says, I, I didn't know you were a pastor. I go, I go yeah, and it's just we're kind of talking about it. But I've met people... And they see me just with Levi's and a t-shirt and a hat. And they, they say, well, what do you do? I go, I'm a pastor. And they just kind of look at my clothes. And, <laughs> you know, where's the velvet, velvet suit? You know, <laughs> kind of like with, it, with your pink tie or whatever. And I, I don't dress that way because I'm trying to be cool. I'm not trying to, like, be a gangster or nothing. I just, I just like to be comfortable, you know. <laughs> but a lot of people think that we should. But we don't want to scare people. Once you once you make once people feel comfortable with you, you can share the gospel with them. Very important, amen. amen. And so David, as you look at the scripture there, uh, as we look at verse uh, two, I will worship your holy name and praise your holy name for your loving kindness and your truth. Well, I'm going to look, verse one, the uh, the last part. Before the gods, I will sing praises to you. So again, he wasn't acting smart, but he wasn't afraid to proclaim the Lord in front of others, and, and especially the devil, uh, he wasn't going to be intimidated. Then we look at verse 2. Then he says something similar. In the first part of verse 1, he said, I will praise. In verse 2, he said, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. And so notice he gives us some information here why he's praising God for a few reasons, but one, a couple of them, you see it in verse 2, because of God's loving kindness or his steadfast love. God loves us all the time, you see. And, and you can't do anything to change that love for you. And then he was praising God for the truth. And then the last part of verse 2, for you have magnified your word above all your name. And so we see David here, he bowed towards the house of God, the temple, which was the custom of the godly Jews. But you look at that last part of verse 2 where it says, for you have magnified your word above all your name. This has to, do, has to do with the strong faithfulness of God in keeping his word, keeping his promises. Second Corinthians chapter 1, there's a verse that says, all the promises of God are yes and amen. And that's something that you learn. I, I started reading my Bible when I first got saved, but you, we don't learn everything right away. You, there's things that you have to experience. And, but one thing I can tell you, that God does keep his promises. And you're not wasting your time when you're standing on whatever he says. God, God really wants us to see 
how precious and how powerful his word is and what the Lord can do through his word. And so, especially in our own personal lives, the Lord magnifies his word way up there. So he's letting us know that it's very, very important that we read and we hear the word of God. And you have a lot of believers today that are losing interest in the Bible. There, there's, a, there's a trend happening, especially with the millennials and, and, and the hipsters. And I live, live close to L.A., Hollywood, and, and, you know, Echo Park and Silver Lake, and all that. It's lot, hipsters, I mean, they're not evil. They're, but they're mostly nice people. They, they, they like to wear tight jeans, amen? But anyway, <laughs> I... I <laughs> David Rosales always talks about these pastors with skinny jeans and you know, all that kind of thing. But, you know, God loves everybody. But what's happening is you have these churches coming up, and they want to reach people, especially the young people, maybe from teenagers to 35 years old or whatever. So they purposely structure churches that would cater to them. Uh, they, it's real uh, vintage style. There's nothing wrong with that. Vintage style, you know, high rows, vintage lights, you know, gray, black, you know, the chairs, you know, free coffee when you walk in, and, and you know, and a lot of, of amped up music. You know, it's got to be amped up. You got to have a big stage with 19 people, and there's there, everybody's on their feet for like 50, 55 minutes. See, young people like that. It's like going to a concert. It's like going to a rave concert. I don't go to them. I stopped going two months ago. But anyway, <laughs> oh, thank God the Lord delivers. Thank God he delivers. Amen. He's a delivering God. Amen. I used to walk in there and say, what's that old man doing here? And, uh, I, I didn't do that. I'm sure there is some weirdos that do that. But, <laughs> but you know, and so what do are, what are, what are these young, many times young ministers do? They and they have the, their backup from their churches to set up these, these chapels or these structures. You know, they, rent, they rent warehouses and stuff. Nothing wrong with warehouses. But, but they purposely avoid giving a long Bible study because they know that these youngsters, these young hipsters, and they, they, they're, they're hyper and they're restless. So I can stand up and sing amped up songs for 50 minutes as long as you promise not to give me more than a 10-minute Bible study, if even that. And then we can go to the cafe after, and we can talk and get our laptops out and our iPhones and do all You see, the truth is, is that we live in a society like never before where people want to be entertained. You guys all know, and I'm not pointing fingers here, but you walk in the restaurant, you have a whole family, nobody's talking to each other, everybody's on. Even grandma's all. <laughs> God, I don't even want to know what she's looking at, you know. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I, that's, that's the way it is. And, and so everybody wants to be entertained. I, I was walking to a mall the other day in West Covina. I was looking for uh, some pants or something. And, and I was looking at the stores and just kind of looking around. And then I seen this store. It was kind of dark and had little curtains. Kind of, I looked like that. And they had these, like, theater-style chairs and all these kids with those things. And they're doing the video stuff. And... And so it's, it's like we live in that kind of society. And then we live in a society that everybody wants everything right away. You don't even have to leave your house no more. You can order your food, your clothes. You, know, you can stay in your pajamas all day or whatever. And you don't have to go nowhere. Everything's drive through in and out. There's a lot of different, get your coffee, get your hamburger. Go, go. You don't even have to get out of the car to get, get money out of the bank. And everything's fast. The society's like that. And everybody's being entertained. So a, a young person looking for a church, they can't hang here. They say, what? This guy's still teaching, you know? <laughs> you know? Yeah. But really, how many know the need for the word never changes? That, never, that doesn't go with styles and fads and cultures. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. He said that, right? So I'll go along with what he said rather than what the hipster on Melrose is talking about, you know. These are beautiful people. Everybody, God wants to save everybody, but I tell you what, ministers are robbing people because you don't give people what they want, you give them what they need. Oh, there's nothing wrong with being a little trendy and, and having a coffee shop and, and having nice music. There's nothing wrong with that. But we have to draw the line somewhere. If you want to be trendy, that's cool, but don't rob them of the word of God.
because those people are hurting, they're suicidal, you know? I had this young girl that comes to our church, she's 17 years old, when she just turned 18, she was been in camp twice already. She went to camp when she was 14, she did like nine months, she got out and, you know, her mom was having all these problems with her. She got all gangster and young, and and she came to church, and she got saved in our church. And then she started going to Homeboy um, Industries, and she got a job there, there in East L.A., and she's doing good. She's helping. They even sent her to Chicago with a group of people to share her story, you know, because Homeboy Industries is known all over the world. And I go, how did, how did it go? Her name is Leah. I go, how did it go, Leah? She goes, good. I, I got up there, and I told the people I want, can I talk about God when I get me on the bush? Yeah, Leah, go for it. And she so shared about the Lord. But then she comes to church and she goes, I want to be taught the word of God. So, when, so young people, old people, it doesn't matter. It's what we need. We need this. We need this. And so uh, here David brings it out that God magnifies his word. He puts it in a high position. And then you have a bunch of Christians and ministers are putting it way down here. And they're putting music and testimonies and free hot dogs and all that up here, you know? That's what's important. I mean, I like the hot dog part, but you know, everything's... And then the words, you know, and you ask them, well, how was the teaching? Oh, well, the pastor read one scripture and told, cracked a few jokes and, you know, stories that he went through, stuff he went through during the week. And Yeah, people walk out and they, feel inter they, they felt like they're entertained, but they don't have no substance. See, people are hurting today like never before. Anxiety, depression, that's, that's not a joke anymore. It's real. And I, I would never dare make fun of anybody. Some pastors are like, oh, brother, just pray and you'll get over it. No, dude, it's not, it's not always that easy. It's a, it's a serious thing. I went through it in the early 2000s, and it was like a heavy blanket on me. And I go, God, I, apparent, there's no apparent thing wrong that I... But man, I felt so sad and so ugly and so empty inside. And my wife went through that too. But you know what? My wife and myself, we just kept sharing the word and just reading the word and praying. The Bible says that God sent his word and healed them. So it's wrong for pastors to tell somebody, oh, just get over it, man. Just, just get right with God and, and you, you shouldn't even be, it's just a mental thing. No, it, it's, a, it's a disease. You see, and, but I also know that we have the victory in Jesus. So when a person's battling with depression and anxiety, let me say this. It's hard to get out of your house sometimes. It's, it's hard to go to work. But you know what? You've got to push yourself. You've got to go to church and meet with the Lord. Uh, David said, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord so I can see his beauty and his power. Church is not the only place to be encouraged and be strengthened and be healed, but a, a big part of all that does happen in, in a Bible study with the word. As you have your pastor sharing the word, and Pastor David believes in the power of the Holy Spirit, we don't have to do nothing weird. We don't have to dim the lights and start talking crazy or whatever. You can just sit there and casually, God can move supernaturally and set you free as you're sitting there. It, yeah. Yeah, we don't have to do weird stuff. I don't have to be running around with my dicky jacket or whatever, you know, you know, blowing on people. I don't have to do that. God does a good job by himself. You don't need me to be running around here and go to the parking lot and come back, you know. When I was in that Christian home, they used to take us to all these crazy places. I was a young Christian, you know. and We go to these big old uh, conferences and the preacher would be preaching, all of a sudden somebody starts running around the church. And I, I go, homeboy's getting some good exercise, you know. I, I said, so distracting. And I, I'm a young Christian, who am I? I? I didn't say nothing. I wasn't in a position to say nothing. But, but you know, and then later on, I, I, as we got involved, and my sister-in-laws were getting saved at Chuck Smith Church in Raw Reese, and my sister-in-law gave me some tapes of course, it was cassette tapes back then, amen? So uh, gave me some tapes by uh, Raul Reese. I remember one thing he said. He says, God can move supernaturally in a casual environment. We don't have to be doing, we don't have to amp up anything. We don't have to start, you know, I'm not against tongues. The Bible talks about it. But we don't have to start speaking in tongues and start bringing up the volume. And, and then it's real loud. And once it gets up here, we think, okay, God's going to show up. God shows up regardless. 
Jesus said, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. He don't need me to wake him up. I need to wake up. That's why we don't know the Bible. We say stuff like, we got to wake God up, get. No, he's here. And in fact, the Bible says he neither sleeps nor slumbers. He don't sleep. We do. When you're asleep, he's watching over you. Isn't that good? Amen. You say, well, if he's watching over me, why do I have nightmares? Too many jalapenos. Come on now. I say, come on now, you guys. Right? So let's look at verse 3. Verse 3, he said, In the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. Here we have the main reason or the one of the reasons, anyway, David was praising the Lord. Verses 1 and 2 is because of answered prayer. God always answers prayer. You know, it may not be what you want it, but it's still an answer. And that's, you want what he wants anyway, right? Not thy will, but not my will, but your will be done. And sometimes no answer is his answer. It's, it's no. Or maybe he's going to do something later. That's why the Bible says we have need of patience, that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. And then verse 4, all the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, when you hear the words of your mouth. Yes, they will sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. There's a couple of things here. This is also prophetical. In the thousand-year reign of Christ, everybody's going to bow themselves to Christ. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, and people will go to Jerusalem. They will worship God. God will be in control. We know that, and we'll be praising the Lord. It's going to be beautiful. But also, he's talking about his current situation. David is, is he wanted people to know that he loved the Lord. I, I pray that the kings and the people see me doing this because he, he loved God and he loved people because God wants us to allow him to be seen in our life. Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, there's a scripture in chapter 1 where he says, I pray that Christ be magnified in me. And so that was David's heart. And then you look at verse 6, though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly. And, and you guys know that. He's way up there. He's powerful. He created the ground you walk on, but he has regard for you. He cares. We went to feed the homeless. We feed the homeless at our church once a month, but we went to downtown L.A. Uh, two months ago. Uh, that place is, is, there's more homeless there than in all the country. I mean, every street was filled with homeless. And, and there's a lot of people there playing games. There's drug dealers on the corner. I, I understand that, but there are some women there with their kids and but, you know, I, I looked at everybody, and, and like you do, you look at people, and you say, man, God loves them too. God loves everybody. You know, my mom used to tell me growing up she wasn't a Christian, but she used to say, mijo, you know, God hates the rich and loves the poor. And I said, well, I guess you always love us, huh? Shoot. <laughs> you know, looking in that refrigerator, there ain't nothing happening in there, you know. But... But we have this weird perspective about God until we get saved and start reading the Bible. He loves everybody. And that, that will help you in your relationship towards people. I was sharing with, in, a, in the 8 o'clock service this morning that this lady was coming to our church, and she was kind of uppity, Hispanic lady, well, you know, business lady, whatever. But she came, and about three weeks after she came, she came up to me kind of crying. I go, what happened, sister? She goes, I want to ask you to forgive me. I go, for what? She goes, well, I came in your church, and I seen you have, like, ex-gang members here. And, I, you know, not everybody here is not exactly Harvard graduates, you know. And I go, yeah, what about it? She goes, well, I, I, I got me mad because I don't like gang members, and I don't like this and that. But, you know, I kept hearing the word of God, and God softened my heart. And I want to ask you to forgive me for even thinking that. See, we all have issues, and we all battle with things, but God's the only one that can make it right. Amen. And it's all in the heart. Greg Laurie had said, the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. It's all in here. Jesus said everything comes from here, evil or good. And so we let the word come in there and really, really make us more like Jesus, right? We sing a song at our church, I want to be more like Jesus. Because really, that's the purpose. God has a purpose for you. He, he doesn't just save you. Well, what are we going to do with this guy, or this girl? We'll just kind of you know, wing it. No, he knows what he's doing with you. He wants to make you more like Jesus. That's why he starts plucking out that junk out of us that's contrary to the life of Jesus. He's a good Lord. So that's in verse 6. And then look at verse 7. We're, and of course, we've got one more verse after that. Though I walk in the midst of trouble. We all walk in the midst of trouble. 
Some trials we kind of deal with all right. Some are in a different category where it makes you feel like, I don't know what to do. Those are the rough ones. Those are the ones where the devil comes and says, if God loved you, why is he letting you go through this? But because you know the word, you don't listen to that. You don't consider what the devil says. The Bible says, consider Jesus. We consider what he has said. And so he said, though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You, you sense the confidence that David had that no matter what he went through, God would always do something to help him through it. And so he says that there. He says that I walk through the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You'll give me life. How, how many would agree that some stuff knocks all the life out of you? That's why you don't want to go nowhere. You just want to sit down and say, Lord, I, people call, hey, man, you want to go with me to the mall? Go eat? No, I, don't, I just don't feel good right now. You know, as long as we don't give up, it's okay, because God will put his arm around you, and he'll minister to you. And when you say a little prayer to him, even though you don't feel like praying, he'll give you life. He'll revive you, so you can finish that race. It's like a guy running track, and then you see somebody from the crowd give him a bottle of water, gives him life to keep going. God always gives you scriptures. God always gives you hope all the time. I got saved December 7, 1975, away up north in that prison. And I remember when I was getting out 21 months after I got saved, one of the guards says, you know, you're going to be back just like everybody else. And I told him, you know, that cell up there in the third, third floor up there, uh, the third tier, he goes, yeah, that's, you, you know, that's where I was at. He goes, yeah. I said, something happened in there, you know, 21 months ago. I, laid on my bunk, and I gave my heart to Jesus. I said, something's telling me that you might not ever see me. I thank the Lord that I never went back there. Amen. See, Jesus not only saves, but he sustains. And I think people need to know that. Everybody needs to know that God not only saves, but he will keep you. I don't care what you go through. you got to hold on to his hand. And don't let the devil lie to you and say, oh, you know, God, he knows that this stuff really gets to you. And if so, if he really loves you, no, no. All things work together, not for bad, but for good, for those that love God and are called according to his prayer. They work for good. So the scriptures, it always goes back to the scriptures. If I don't know no word, what do, what do I hang on to? Listening to some dumb advice, some guy at my work that... You know, he doesn't know anything. Well, brother, if I was you, I'd just get drunk and forget about it. No, that's bad counsel. How many would agree that's not godly counsel? It's not rocket science. We know that. But we need the word in our heart. I said we need the word in our heart. So verse 7, though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies and set your right, right hand will save. Your right. That means the, the last part of verse 7 reminds us that he controls everything. And then our last verse, verse 8, the Lord will perfect or complete. As we're getting ready to finish, look at verse 8. David talked about a current situation. He reflect back, and God always revived me, took care of me. And here he's, he's kind of like peeking into the future. And he says, when he says the Lord will perfect or the Lord will complete that which concerns me, that's future. So the, the truth is that Lord took care of you before you're a Christian. Even though we, didn't, we weren't serving him, how many know he protected us? Because he knew that one day you'd get saved. Amen. And so he's protecting you today. And we have to remember from the scriptures, he will take care of you tomorrow and next month and next year. That's why Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Didn't he say that? And so the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. Let's go to our last scripture, Isaiah 46 and verse 4. Somebody gave me, somebody gave me this verse a few days ago, and I, 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 I've read it, but i never really seen it in light of what it's really saying. Isaiah, and you guys know that Isaiah's got all kinds of nice scriptures, but if you go to Isaiah 46... And let's look at verse 4. So I just wanted to share with you what we read today and kind of tie the knot by saying, God will take care of you today and God will take care of you tomorrow. And so we, we go through things. and we, we don't, I don't like to go through trials. I don't get a kick out of it. But it, it happens. Jesus said in the world, you will have tribulations. 
But he didn't leave us there. He said, but be of good cheer. Didn't he say that? He said, I've overcome the world. So if you hang on to him, you'll overcome. The Bible says we have victory in Jesus. Isaiah 46 and verse 4, thinking about what, where David said, the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. God's going to complete everything that's concerned me, that's part of me. He'll take care of it. That means he'll fulfill the plan in my life. That means he will protect me. He'll deliver me. He'll take care of me. He'll answer my prayers according to his will. Isaiah 46, 4 says, even to your old age, I am he. I, I will, I'll be the same to you. I've been walking with the Lord quite a few years, and I want to share testimony to you. He's still the same to me. Maybe I've been a jerk, but he's, he's, been, he's the same. He still loves me. He still loves you. Five years from now, if the Lord tarries, he'll still love you, and he'll still protect you, and he'll still deliver you, you see. It doesn't change, and I think the Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Even to your old age, I am he, even to gray hairs. Can you say amen? amen. We can all relate, most of us anyway. I know I can. And even to gray hairs, I will carry you. And the point is, and don't matter how old you are, how, the, how many years go by, I will carry you. So I'll take care of you. I have made, speaking of how he made you, and I will bear you. Bear means I will sustain you, I will hold you. <coughs> So not only does he save you, but he sustains you and he will carry you. Look at the last part of verse 4. Even, even I will carry and will deliver you. That's the promise. And I want to leave you with that, that, that he's carrying you. And whatever you go through, whatever I go through, he will deliver you. That's the promise. He's, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen.